G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for today's edition of Eagles Corner. We've had a win. I think this is the, well, it's the first time in a long time that we've had a win for a start. I think going back to about round 15 of last year, uh, it was our second win at Optus Stadium since round 21, 2021. And uh, we were on a record nine losses in a row for the second time in a row, I think. Um, but we've we've reset that record and hopefully uh, we're not doing this again in nine games time. It feels good. It feels good. I think the uh, it's very, very rare that I come and do an Eagles video after a win. Um, there hasn't been a reason to do that for a long time. So uh, it's good to be here. And I'm sure you're all like me if you're an Eagles fan, um, enjoying being on the winners list for... Yeah, the first time in a long time, it seems. Um, it was a good performance overall. Obviously a little bit patchy, but I think the takeaways from this game is we kind of saw the the, sh the shoots of a side that we have been building towards or trying to build towards um, since the end of 2021. Obviously, last year everything went to shit and we couldn't get any continuity going. Um, and round one... We saw some good signs, although I think the, the poor performance in the second quarter really outshone that. And this is the first time we really saw us play a style that is noticeably different. And the fact that we were able to actually execute on that style for large periods of the game is the most pleasing part. Now, it is only uh, you know the first win of the season, and uh, we're a long way from really proving the doubters wrong, as it were. But it is nice to see that, you know, I've had some optimism this preseason, um, as I always do. And uh, there have been so many 50-50 tips that I've backed the Eagles on over the last, you know, 12 to 18 months that have gone terribly. So it's nice to be sitting here saying the blind faith was, uh, it was repaid for the first time in a while. But we shouldn't get carried away. Um, it's a really, really good start. As much as anything, it looks like there's a degree of confidence back and, and we look a little bit cleaner um, and all that ties into confidence. And um, obviously we weren't playing uh, a side that we expect to play finals this year, but either way, we haven't played like that in a long time. So good, good start. All of my logic was telling me that, um, you know, we would lose this game. And I think for the most part, the safe tip would have been GWS because we failed to deliver on any degree of optimism I've had, um, you know, as I've said. So I was just waiting for the day that it would finally click. And I wouldn't say it clicked in a massive way, um, but it certainly clicked for to be good enough for long enough to actually win a game of football against a side that isn't terrible. So um, either way, this is a huge step in the right direction. Although we do acknowledge that it wasn't a complete performance, wasn't perfect. Giants had a lot of outs. Uh, some things went our way, but at the end of the day, we were the better side over four quarters. So I think first and foremost, when, you, when you're looking at the key factors that won us this game and why we look like a different side, a lot has been said of ball movement. And I think Adam Simpson has captured a pretty good explanation of, of, of this issue um, in the last couple of press conferences. He's talked about how the fact that, yes, we move the ball poorly from backwards, from, from our defense into our forward line, but the real issue is that the fact that the ball is like strangled in our back line to begin with. So the way we fix that is by actually winning some contested ball, winning the ball out of the center, not getting dominated in the clearances. Uh, and we saw that we at least broke even. In fact, we won a lot of the major stats in the midfield. And thus our defense, we weren't having to rely on McGovern and Brass to set up our attacks from the back half. So, you know, typically we've played like a, you know, an aerially dominant side um, that relies on us being able to intercept and cut off opposition attacks and reload from the back half when necessary, but it can't be our entire game style, right? So we've put together this, this back six, this defensive line of really good intercept players who aren't necessarily great ground ball players for the most part and are certainly not equipped to be able to move up the ball quickly uh, because those are just the attributes of a, a Barras and a McGovern and even some of the smalls as well. You know, too often over the last couple of years, we've just seen, you know, the Eagles get the ball in the back half and they look up the field and it's just a congested um, 50. There's a fucking chihuahua going absolutely nuts. I'm going to have a sip of coffee. Too often over the last you know, couple of years, we'd, we'd see the ball sort of strangled in our back 50. You look up the field and you just see an absolute army of uh, both Eagles and opposition players all in our back half. And of course, we can't move the ball quickly through that zone. Of course, we kick it sideways. Um, to some extent... We're asking too much to be able to set up too many forward forays, you know, just trying to get the ball from our back line to the forward line. 
So long story short, when we're breaking even or even winning the midfield battle, as we so often do with Nick Nat Nui in the side, which is why I've talked a lot about our reliance on him. If we're winning the midfield battle, then obviously the, the field's a bit more spread out and our ability to move the ball quickly um, is greatly enhanced. And I think we saw that massively today. And you factor in that we didn't do that with a dominant Ruckman, as we've relied on so much since 2018. Obviously, we won the flag without Nick Nat, but since then, there has been a huge reliance on him. So first of all, I think this win was really engineered by someone like Tim Kelly in particular. He was a guy that I, I must admit I roasted him at the end of um, in my round one video, which is possibly a little bit harsh. Uh, you know, he absolutely the criticism for that game was justified, but uh, he looked like he came out with an absolute mission to perform well and prove people wrong. And uh, to you know, fair play to him, he did that. He had seven first quarter possessions, three clearances, and a goal. And you could tell the intensity was there. You could see the emotion when he kicked that goal. He certainly had a point to prove, and it really, really came out. And he played really, really well. So the midfield performance was really, really strong. And it's worth noting as well, GWS's ruckman Matt Flynn is is solid, but it's not as though we came up against a dominant tap ruckman, which may expose us against some of those sides that do have a dominant tap ruckman. But for the most part, uh, we did really, really well with the soldiers that we have. We won the clearances 37 to 33. We won the contested possessions 125 to 119, and we won the inside 50 count. When was the last time we won the inside 50 count? I reckon if you go back to look at our two wins last year, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but I reckon we probably lost the inside 50 count in those games too, because we just had an efficient forward line. But we actually got supply this game with 58 inside 50s. So great job to the midfield, engineered primarily by Tim Kelly. But there was also a noticeably different willingness to play on and run and gun at all costs to some extent. And largely, J Jermaine Jones um, was a massive um, architect of this feature. And, you know, guys like Shuey as well, running in from behind for handball receive, move the ball in quickly. You can see that this side is trying to implement his new style. Uh, we just haven't really had the ability to, you know, put it into effect just yet. But obviously this game was won largely off the back of a massive eight goal second quarter. It's been a while since we've done that as well. I do remember a game against Carlton. I think it might've been last year where we had a series of like four to six goals or something in a row. We still lost the game, obviously. Uh, but it's been a while since we've scored about 50 points in a quarter like that as well. So the scoring power was there in this game. And again, comes back to the midfield battle. I would like to, um, you know, acknowledge the opposition in each Eagles corner video. And I don't know if there's as much to say about the Giants' performance in this game as there was about North Melbourne last week. Uh, but obviously, I think we went into this game hoping that the Giants would tire because they had such a grueling contest against the Crows. Really fast finishing game last week. And maybe that was a factor. But it was good, at least, that we didn't rely on a fourth quarter burnout from the Giants to, to win the game. We, we won the game in the second quarter. We actually lost three out of the four quarters. But that doesn't matter. I'm not going to focus on the negatives. The second second quarter is where we really dominated enough to win the game and then we just sort of cruised from that point but one noticeable thing was that the talls actually managed to outmark us quite a lot normally aerial marking and intercepting is a feature of our side and I think the Giants had the better better in that specific aspect of the game Jesse Hogan played quite well um, he's a handy footballer on his day just isn't consistent but he kicked three goals arguably should have had more I think left a few goals on the table there Toby Green, he was a hard man to stop, as we expected. Four goals from him. You almost bank that. Three or four goals at the start of the game. Toby Green, that's about right. And for them as well, Lockie Ash, I think uh, he, he caught my eye as well. He had 21 touches, 81% efficiency, 656 metres gained. Uh, quite a effective back half sort of rebound player. Um, someone I'd love to have in our side, but again, he was the one who caught my eye. Overall, you know, with the Giants... <sighs> It's hard to make it out exactly where they are. They've beaten the Crows in round one and they lost to us, but they did catch us on a pretty good day. So while I don't think they're in the mix for finals in the slightest, um, they're certainly not easy beats, which makes this win um, you know, quite pleasing. So we'll highlight some key performances from the Eagles in this game. And one thing I've been musing on uh, is that we really, really would love more from our 21 to 25 year old sort of group of players on our list. That's certainly a weakness and that's probably a product of being successful over that period. So now those players who are now 21 to 25, those are the ones we you know, picked up with later picks or traded in. Um, but this was the group of players in this particular game that virtually all had best games for the club. So we'll start with Jake Waterman, came in as a second ruck, playing a tough role. He's, he's listed at 191 centimetres. I don't, I don't think he's actually that short, but it, yeah, regardless, he played a role, wasn't massively effective as a ruck, got a, got a few hit outs, but pleasingly he got four goals um, and was quite efficient with the opportunities he's got as well. He, he can be an average field kick, but he's actually a pretty surprisingly accurate kick for goal. Um, so well done, Jake Waterman, on probably his best game for the footy club. And Jermaine Jones was probably the second best player on the field, I think. I have Tim Kelly as our best on ground in this game. But Jermaine Jones... 
you know, played forward in the first game and kicked a couple of goals from 13 possessions, did a roll, and we acknowledge that this guy has been thrown around the field a little bit. And the fact that he's been able to move back, add something, add a lot of drive, um, it looks like he's playing with confidence. Yes, he butchers some kicks, but I like the fact that he's taking these riskier options. So I feel very strongly that we can't criticize players for being too conservative and then burn them for making mistakes when they're trying to be creative. So Jermaine Jones, I think, was pretty instrumental in us being able to play this run and gun style. So that's Waterman and Jermaine Jones, who probably had their best games at AFL level, at least from what I can remember. And Sam Petrovsky Seaton at least had his best game for the Eagles, um, as you know, we picked him up as this sort of almost like a project, but somewhat high potential player who didn't quite make it at Carlton. And we've put him in this niche role of being a defensive forward. And last year, he was in and out of the side. He was batting a knee injury. And I must admit, I probably didn't really see the potential with him. But this is that Eagles side that took place in round two was the best side that he's played in since he got here. And he was far more effective with his 20 possessions um, and really, really tidy, accurate kicks. And I think his defensive pressure is is pretty good, actually. He may not actually land some tackles, but his chases have been pretty solid. So I'd like to acknowledge SPS for a really good game for us as well. And even with it, a guy that um, cops a bit of criticism and you know, even from me at times, but he played a bit of a defensive role on Toby Green, and yes, Toby Green kicked four goals, but there could have been more. Toby Green is an absolute superstar, and Witherden um, was acknowledged by Simpson as well uh, for doing a pretty good job on him, and some of his kicks sort of opened up the play a little bit, which is why he's in the side predominantly, right? He's meant to be this player that opens up the field with his kicks, um, which used to be a feature of us back when we were good. Witherden has that potential, so it was nice to see him play decently well, and you know I think he keeps his spot for next week. Then there's Bailey Williams, who I think gets a bad rap um, from Eagles fans as well. I think we've been extremely blessed with quality rucks that have been good at a really young age, and Bailey Williams has been given a lot of responsibility over the last couple of years to be, you know, at times the number one ruck. In fact, most of the time the number one ruck over the last couple of years, and uh, he may not have won the hit out count, and it may have been against a relatively young ruckman in Flynn, but he still held his own really well, and I thought some of his follow-up efforts were good. So for a 23-year-old ruck, I'm pretty happy with the way Bally Williams is going, and I thought he was noticeably good in this game. So that's a whole stack of players in that age bracket that played some of their best footy um, in this particular game. So that's really promising uh, when you consider the transition over the next few years. Maybe it's not as bleak as it once looked. I did acknowledge Tim Kelly already, BOG. Shuri was great. He played a fair bit down back as well, but he still won nine clearances when he went into the midfield. Jamie Cripps is an underrated footballer. I've always been a Jamie Cripps fan for his defensive pressure. And it's nice to see that he actually had some touchback, you know, none of this double grabbing stuff. Um, he had some clean possessions in that gather and snap. Um, I think it was in the second quarter. That was a fantastic effort. So great to see him play well. And interestingly, he's going to be offered a contract pretty soon, it sounds, but we'll talk about that some other time. And one of the best players on the field was also Jaden Hunt, who uh, has come in and he's actually impressed me. He's better than I thought he was. I kind of just thought he might have been this one dimensional, you know, run in a straight line with a ball kind of player, bomb it long, but he's actually a lot more measured than that. He's a bit more defensively sound and he hit the scoreboard for two goals as well. So it was great to see Jaden Hunt um, also play his best game for the club. One out of two ain't bad. So those were some of our best performers. I would like to do a little segment where we focus on some of the teenagers we had playing in this game. Because uh, we had four in this round with Elijah Hewitt being the tactical sub um, who came on for the last quarter as well. But Noah Long, this guy had an underrated game. Or maybe not underrated, I think people are seeing it. But for a guy who only had seven touches, I thought his impact was quite profound. He had yeah, seven touches. Four of those were score involvements. Two of them were direct goal assists, um, which was the most on, uh, of anyone on the field, if I'm not mistaken. Four tackles as well. And if you go back and watch tape of how he actually played, all of his possessions were very meaningful and and actually got us into a better position and there was a there was a play on the um on the far flank from the broadcast side where he gathered the ball he saw sheet right there and instead of handballing it to the first option like so many 18 year olds do in his second game he had the poise to go okay no i can actually run around the guy near me and hit up a better target down the field so that shows a lot of confidence already so huge fan of noah long Ruben Jimby also had a, um, a pretty good game. He, he was given a bit of a defensive task on Tom Green, who still had like 27 possessions, but still nullified the impact um, on a big-bodied midfielder that really had the potential to tear us up. And Jimby ended the game with the most tackles of any Eagles, second most on the field with six as well. And believe it or not, for an 18-year-old playing his second game, I actually think if Jimby were to get 
you know, touch wood, injured or reported, we would feel the difference, which is as much of a compliment as I can give an 18-year-old midfielder. He would generally, we would generally lose something from the side if you take out, you know, the player who is our best tackler right now. So uh, that's a really good endorsement for Ruben Jinby. Obviously, Chester, on the other hand, was quite quiet. He had five possessions in the first game, six uh, in this game as well. And I think, I think we're probably not setting him up to succeed in the best way possible by just chucking him on the wing. I think he's getting lost a little bit. My two ways to combat this personally would be playing behind the ball in a Harry Sheasel kind of unaccountable style, uses speed and skill, and most importantly, when you're playing in the back half, the ball kind of comes to you a little bit. Um, so that's the best way to learn how to win the footy if, if you're struggling at it. That's what I would do with Chessa. His performance may not be enough to keep his spot this week, unfortunately, um, so he may go back to the waffle, but uh, I really want us to get Brady Hoff into the side. He had a really good waffle game as well, so perhaps Hoff in for Chessa would be the move I would make. And Elijah Hewitt got a, a quarter of footy in, had three touches, unlucky with that holding ball decision. Um, I'd love to see this kid play. I think he's ready for AFL minutes. It's just a case of, at the moment, I don't think anyone in the midfield or the forward line is playing poorly enough to get dropped. So Hewitt, they either bring in for Chesser. Uh, I don't know if he can play on a wing effectively. That's why I'd probably go Hoff. Or he goes back to the waffle. He can't sub two weeks in a row. He'll uh, lose too many minutes playing like that. So if they can find a way to squeeze him into the side, that's ideal. If not, he's just going to have to go back to the waffle this week, I think. I don't really want to harp on about negatives in this game, um, but one thing I'll point out was, gee, Tom Barras had a dirty day. Um, in round one, obviously, uh, Nick Lark has kicked six goals on him. I defended that a little bit because I still think he tried valiantly. It's just that Larky was a good player. Um, some of his goals weren't on Barras. But in this game, early on, he, he you know he fluffed a few sort of regulation defensive efforts. Um, then he got frustrated and uh, was it Hamilton? I think he sort of needlessly gave away a free kick to got beaten in the air by Hogan uh, both he and McGovern were beaten by Hogan at various points and he just looked lethargic uh, which is poor timing because I've just t uh, said that he was in the top 20 plays in the competition in one of my videos because I think he justified that on last year's form he's had a bit of a rocky start to the season so maybe he just had the flu or something but either way yeah dirty day for Barras so overall I, you know I've just thrown heaps of positives at you but I think as well the North beating Frio result also, to me, just validates us a little bit. You know, we all were very critical of the Eagles. I'll, I'll say that I was one of them, um, particularly on that second quarter effort. You know, you take out the second quarter last week, um, and you know it was it was a fairly okay performance. And you look at North Melbourne now, who sit two and zero and just knocked off a finalist from last year on their home deck and played some pretty compelling footy. So when you think about that. All I'm saying is we've made enormous progress from last year, which is exactly what I had predicted for this year. Um, so hopefully we'll keep up that momentum. No more drop-offs or at least massive drop-offs. And this week's a big game. We've got the Western Derby. Make no mistake, um, for the first time in a while, we are good enough to beat Freo on current form. Partially, you know, that's concern for Fremantle at the moment with their structure. I don't think we're a better side than Fremantle by any stretch. But as, as our, the two sides intersect right now, we'll be walking an inch taller this week and Fremantle will be a little bit concerned about, you know, how they structure up. But either way, you know, it's an important game for Fremantle, even more so than for us. So I'll be able to give you a proper detailed preview. Uh, Druzy and I will preview the Western Derby in this week uh, in the lead up to round three, which would hopefully be a good game. I'm planning to live stream it as well from home with dad as well. So that will be good fun. So if you're into the live stream stuff, come and join us. Anyway, guys, that was just me rambling on about the Eagles um, for the second week in a row. So hopefully um, you enjoyed the video. Give us a, a like on the video if you have. Um, but most importantly, give me your thoughts on the game. Who played well? Who didn't? What sort of changes would you make for next week? And do you think we're a chance to beat Freeman on the Derby? This could just be this win getting to my head. But uh, I'm sure I'm not the only Eagle uh, who's let this get to their head already. So anyway, guys, appreciate you watching the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.